I'm glad to see you all here. I think you'll really be excited by our speaker today, <laughs> Anuradha Mittal, who's the founder and executive director of the Oakland Institute. An independent thinker. Ms. Mittal was named Most Valuable Thinker of 2008 by The Nation magazine. She's authored and edited numerous books and reports including Misinvestment in Agriculture, the Role of the International Finance Corporation in the Global Land Grab, The Great Land Grab, Rush for the World's Farmland Threatens Food Security for the Poor, Voices from Africa, African Farmers and Environmentalists Speak Out Against a New Green Revolution, and many other works. She's addressed the U.S. Congress, the U.N., and many other universities and government uh, pieces. She's been interviewed on CNN, BBC World, CBC, ABC, Al Jazeera, National Public Radio, and Voice of America. She's on the board and advisory committees of several nonprofit organizations, including the Right Livelihood Award, the Alternative Nobel Prize, and the International Forum on Globalization. And she's also a member of an independent board providing leadership to the social mission of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream Company. So, without further ado, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Anuradha Mittal. Thank you very much, and thank you, Judith, um, for um, organizing this and having me come out and um, for all of you to come out here. I'll just start with a brief thing on the Oakland Institute, what it is. It was founded in 2004 um, out of sheer frustration when we saw President Bush win his next election and recognizing that there is a need for a progressive think tank in the United States, not just a liberal think tank, um, to be able to kind of do what the Hudson, Cato, Heritage are able to do for the right wing. Why the name Oakland Institute? You know, people always say, you know, we are so used to progressive places being called Center for Global Justice, Center for Human Rights, whereas Cato or Heritage wouldn't call themselves Center for Generating Unemployment. <laughs> so. So when we were kind of thinking for what kind of name, we decided, you know, we're based in Oakland. It has a great political history, birthplace of the Black Panthers, um, one of the most racially integrated cities in the United States. Doesn't speak too well for the US, I have to say, but it is. So we decided to go with the Oakland Institute where we are. And about three years ago, we embarked on a project. Um, hadn't, you know, usually, you think about what you're working on, it was 2008, food price crisis, just between uh, 2007, 2008, food prices had increased by nearly 80%. Um, it was a trend that had never been seen before. Um, for the first time, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization acknowledged that the impact of that was that over a billion people, one-sixth of humanity, who make less than a dollar a day, that they are uh, now food insecure, a very nice way of saying basically that they're going hungry. And our estimates were, if you think of even people earning $2 a day, that would make half the humanity, was actually facing food insecurity. Because when the prices went up in countries, in the poor countries, where the poor spend nearly 70 to 80 percent of their income on food, you knew who was feeling the impact. And it was no different, by the way, in the United States, where a lot of corporations stopped giving donations to the food banks. You know, it wasn't as much in the news. You know, hunger in the U.S. is never as uh, sexy as, uh, you know, as showing hunger in Africa. So while a lot of people jumped on, and, and we were one of them, trying to understand this uh, the food price crisis, increasing food prices, how is it different from the earlier food price crisis, a lot of things started emerging. And what differentiated it from the other ones were two main characters. One was, in our analysis, of course, biofuels or agrofuels, conversion of food into our ethanol and diesel. The other was speculation which is a totally new phenomena. And that was very interesting. Even today, if you look at the wheat prices that went up in January, and by the same amount, they came down by March and again went up. I mean, if it is a shortage of food, it doesn't happen. It doesn't go up and down. So the role of speculation. And when we stepped back, there was another trend that was emerging, which media 
Um, and, and it was interesting, it was not a non-media issue. It was already in the media, New York Times, Guardian, newspapers had front page stories on countries, Gulf states, you know, Gaddafi's sovereign wealth fund, Malibia, going into places like Mali, in Pakistan, um, it was happening big time, where food insecure countries were going into countries, poorer countries, and taking over lands. And it was a symbol of food insecure nations trying to ensure their food supply. It was also countries that were threatened by this whole import bills going up, wanting to steady the import bills. And it was at the same time financial crisis was unfolding. And then we started seeing not just the foreign investors that were being talked about in the media, there was a whole new class of investors, private equity funds and hedge funds that have never had anything to do with agriculture were moving into agriculture. For the first time, the phenomena of ag investment conferences started happening where suddenly people from McKinsey to Goldman Sachs to pension fund people were sitting together talking about the new soft commodity where you can invest in agriculture. So at the same time, FAO, IFAD, these organizations started coming out and sounding their concern around this trend which started to be known as land grabs. And it was very interesting for us while we were sitting and kind of trying to understand it all. And it's almost academic exercise, wondering what, what's going on? You're hearing these media reports, you're hearing this concern, and then you heard World Bank and others move in. Japan, which depends on 60% of its food supply through food imports, come in talking about the need for principles for responsible investments. And you had this whole new development paradigm suddenly outlined for the developing world, which had the blessings of the international financial institutions from the World Bank to Robert Zolik, who's the president of World Bank, but prior to that was the chief of director general of USTR, US trade representative, talking about the role of the private equity in solving the food crisis. And suddenly you had that it can be a win-win situation. Poorer nations who do have the abundance of resources might have water. Uh, virtual trade in water was being talked about. They had land. And then you had richer nations who needed lands to grow their food. That it could be a win-win. It could be a really good coming together, a global exercise to solve world's problems. And as we looked at it, it felt like there were a lot of things that remained unanswered. Everyone had bought into this image of National Geographic or, you know, this Discovery Channel show when you see Africa and you just see these vast, you know, savanna lands, you know, you might see some cheetahs and stuff, and it's like, hey, we can put them to productive use. So without questioning availability of land, and of course, Africa is always one big Africa without thinking of different countries and communities and indigenous communities and tribes, without thinking of all of, all of that, there were few drivers. One was large commercial farms, industrial agriculture will feed the world and Africa can feed herself and feed the rest of the world. Sounds beautiful, right? It, doesn't, it does not victimize Africa. It makes her sound like powerful. She can feed herself and feed the world. Let's go. Second was there's a lot of, unavailable, uh, a lot of available land, unproductive land that can be put to good use. Sounds wonderful. Who would deny that? The third was a whole language of win-win, and we can do it, and then it had the blessings of the World Bank and the rest. So we at the Institute, which is a research think tank, we believe that we need to address knowledge gaps. So in this case, we moved into addressing these knowledge gaps, these loopholes that we believed existed. So we can have a really informed discussion about what is the best paradigm for poorer countries. At the same time, we saw in 2008, because of the increasing food prices, a lot of countries put export bans, which, of course, World Bank and others blamed countries like India as this is the cause for the food crisis. No, that was a response to food crisis. But they did put in export bans. So investors who had been active in places like Brazil and Argentina were like, these countries, and a big name, and president of Argentina was talking about export bans, they were concerned. They wanted a place which allows investment, which is friendly, which is conducive to investment, and Africa looked like a beautiful place. 
So we really wanted to understand all of these questions and have answers to them because it felt like FAO, World Bank, none of these agencies were doing the research. And that got us started on this project. We started with seven countries, which are Tanzania, South Sudan, Mozambique, Zambia, Sierra Leone, Mali, and Ethiopia. And as I said yesterday, if I had known what it would take just in terms of fundraising to do this work, I would have thought twice. <laughs> it seemed like, okay, how do you do research? I'll go to you know, Maputo, you know, you send a researcher into Lusaka, you send a person into you know, Dar, and you know, we'll go and see the investment agencies, we'll go into the land ministry, we'll get the things, and we'll know. No, what it really meant a country the size of Tanzania, a country like Ethiopia or Zambia, which are huge, which our map doesn't tell us, as you all know. I mean, I don't need to tell you that. But um, it really meant that you would have to travel all over the country, meeting with people, and you discover that there are land deals that are happening that nobody ta knows about. Nobody knows about. They are, you cannot get any of this information. So what I'll do is try to tell you stories, but the, also through those stories, the main findings of our work. First of all, why we need to be focusing on it, the main reason is that the pace at which it is happening, how quickly and rapidly it is happening without having all the information at the table so we can have you know, informed decision making is shocking and scary. Our research, which is on conservative terms, would show that more than 70 million hectares of land just in the last couple of years have been leased or, 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 or sold. 70 million hectares is the size of France. This November, International Land Coalition, which is out of Rome, will uh, be releasing a matrix that we have contributed to, which actually is based on country by country being able to determine exact numbers, how much land has actually been leased or foreign owned. But it is shocking, it is just shocking. If you compare it to the figures from before, where it might be 4 million hectares of land per year, 70 million hectares of land in a period of, say, two years or so, it is, is shocking. Country like South Sudan, which became independent on July 9th, already 10% of its land is foreign owned or leased in the last four years it has happened. I mean, it's moving so fast. So there's a real need for that. Second thing, which I said before, lack of transparency. You, I mean, you cannot get any information. What made our work kind of unique, the first phase of our research, if you have had a chance to visit our website, oaklandinstitute.org, we released it in June, and the media and everyone jumped on it. What was unique about it? We basically made it the WikiLeaks of land grabs. For the first time, you have the contracts, you have the business plans, you have everything out there for the deals that we looked at. How did we get it? You do not want me to tell you how we got hold of it. <laughs> I mean, you had to resort to everything to be able to get, but I do want to acknowledge the courageous communities. I mean, it's not that, oh, we are so cool based in Oakland, California. It was a courage of communities who are seeing their lands, the ancestral lands being stolen, who were passing the materials and, and, and really risking their lives getting us these materials and sharing what is actually happening on the ground. It was a Johnny Walker uh, bottle, I'm guilty of that, yes, in Mozambique, to a high official who asked me for it, and he said he will drink half of it, and then he's not responsible for what he gives to me, and I let him get drunk. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, he's a grown-up man, that's what he wants to do, so be it. Director of the investment agency there. So this June, we released materials relating to Ethiopia, Mali, Sierra Leone, and exposed specific land deals which are just so egregious that it would have been unethical on our part to keep quiet if we had that information and we put it out. Uh, so the lack of transparency around it. Also why it is so important to address that issue, just a quick story. In June we released um, a contract for a land deal in South Sudan which involves a U.S. former ambassador. He was appointed during the Reagan administration as the ambassador. Get ready for this, for refugee affairs. One Mr. Howard Eugene Douglas out of Texas, uh, he has started a company called Kinyati Development, Nile Trading Development. Um, he got a million hectares of land for $25,000. Uh, this is not too far from Juba, the capital of South Sudan, but basically they have the right to cut everything that's on top of it 
They have the right to grow anything they want in any fashion they want. This is virgin land. No chemicals have been used on it, but no environmental regulations. They can just go in and do what they want. They can also do exploration for oil, gas, and petroleum. For any of you who is following South Sudan, this is one country where you know there are a lot of minerals, but the government is waiting to do ge geospatial uh, you know, studies to really know what's underneath the ground. So the Mining Act has not yet passed, but the, but the investor went in and got the right to be able to explore. And not just that, they have the right to sublease it to a third party. I mean, they find gas, they can bring in the shell and whatever for $25,000, they would be making whopping millions. U.S. Ambassador and USAID, wonderful, lovely. Also found out later, he's, he was a CIA station chief in Khartoum when the war broke out. So we released their contract because we got hold of it. This deal was signed in 2008, and the community of Mukaya Payam heard about their land being given away for the first time when we released this. So BBC Radio was there doing a radio interview about it, and people were listening. These are communities that have fought a very bloody war so that the land can belong to community. And their response was, we didn't fight Khartoum and the Arabs so that these guys can take it away. So I was in August in South Sudan where the community had traveled to Juba, and in this country you can still do that. They met with the president and met with the governor. They gave the letter from the whole community basically saying, we see those foreign investors. We will not be responsible when we lynch them. Don't let them show up here. And the president said, this is your country, your laws, your government, and if you say this is voided, this deal stands voided. So why that issue of transparency is so important once people know what they can do? I could tell you gazillion stories about just what has happened with just releasing these materials. We're very excited. December 6th, we will be releasing a whole bunch, the next load of stuff around uh, Tanzania, South Sudan, Mozambique, and Zambia. And we're really looking forward to what will happen with that. Um, the other thing that we also found with our research, you know, just this, um, just before we released our report in June, uh, Secretary of State Clinton was in Lusaka, and she warned Africa of this new colonizer and colonization, China. <laughs> I mean, it was an incredible speech, and it was great. She said that, warned Africa of new colonization, and she was talking about the Chinese. She was sharing the platform with a lady by the name of Susan Payne who is the chief executive officer of Emergent Asset Management, who boasts of being the largest agricultural investor in Africa. I have flown with this lady and other people in private planes over Mozambique, Zambia, Swaziland as, uh, with investor group. I've flown with them. And when you ask them, for instance, in Mozambique, they have um, taken over, I mean, in, compared to some of the other places, it's just 2,000 hectares of land. They have taken over 2,000 hectares of land. It's amazing to these investors, they show these incredible circles of, you know, this industrial act that they're putting in. And they boast about how they have agreements where they don't have to pay any taxes. They have complete ho tax holidays. They don't have to pay import duties. They can repatriate their profits. They don't have to hire local people. And in fact, the farm manager who was, um, white Zimbabwean farmer who had to you know, march out of the country on the wrong side of AK-47. He is now running this farm, and I asked him, are you going to hire local people? And he said, it doesn't sound politically correct, but I can tell you, look at these people. They're all potential criminals. So no, your investment will be very safe. We are getting our workers from outside. Same thing that I was told by a US investor in Tanzania, you don't have to worry as an investor, we'll be hiring South Africans white South Africans. Um, so it is really amazing. You look at this and you think, wow, Africa, you know, apartheid is over and liberalization took over. I mean, that's what comes to your mind as you go through these um, land investment deals. Um, but what we also found is that though we keep hearing about the Chinese in Mozambique, in Zambia, all over, you also find, you know, you have your um, hedge funds that are operating out of uh, UK, um, you know, Quayful, which is out of Portugal, or you look at Faros, which is out of Dubai and Moscow, but operating out of the United States. Uh, you have U.S. universities that are investing in funds because they're promising them 20 to 40% returns. You have 
uh, teacher's pension funds that I mentioned yesterday, Teacraft is a big one. Uh, you have the Dutch pension funds. You have the Norwegian pension funds. Development agencies, DFID, CDC, Commonwealth Development Corporation, whose mandate is, is to invest for development in third world countries, is investing in this. USAID is playing a big role in it. Uh, Norfund. You know, Norway has the second largest sovereign wealth fund in the world after, um, I think it is Saudi Arabia is the largest. They are investing in it. And when I've talked to them, they say, well, they have one mandate. They need to at least have 25% returns. And I'll tell you, one of the big things I've learned by being on the board of Ben & Jerry's, when you have trading margins and when you have, uh, you know, your uh, mandates to have at least 20, 25% returns, especially in agriculture, you've got to be kidding yourself. Even in the United States, while we talk about we want the rest of the world to become like the United States, agricultural returns in the United States over the last 15 to 20 years um, and, uh, are not more than 5 to 6 percent returns. So there's nothing magical about, about Asia or Africa. The only thing magical about Africa is that people who talk about a lot of land is available and it is unproductive, no, they are going for the best lands. Over and over again, we have written, you know, brochures from these investors. They are demanding they get the best land, which is most fertile, close to water, close to transport, close to markets. Along with tax holidays, you would wonder, like, you know, while you're at it, you know, you want my mother as well? Um, <laughs> but, but that's what they're asking for. And guess how much they pay? The rates in Tanzania, it is 13 cents per hectare, one three, you know? Um, in uh, Ethiopia, it is, um, uh, Karturi initially got the land for one dollar something, but you know, it is, seems like one of the most expensive places. They're asking for five to six dollars per hectare. In the uh, case of Mozambique, you can get a greenfield operation, i.e. you don't have to pay at all because you will develop that land, never mind people used to be on that land. The same kind of land is about $26,000 in the United Kingdom per hectare. It is about sixteen dollars to $18,000 in the Midwest, in the corn growing belt of America. Even in places such as Argentina or Brazil, it will be at least seven dollars $8,000 per hectare, and you will have regulations. Um, in places like Malaysia, you're looking at about $12,000 per hectare. So this land you're getting with all kind of tax holidays, I mean, if you were an investor, you would have to be really, you would have to have a soul not to rush in, <laughs> right? So that's what's happening and that's what's available land. About availability of land, by the way, uh, I mentioned some of this and I apologize if you were at the lecture yesterday and you might be hearing it again. Um, but. Um, in case of Sierra Leone, we found that the government had been advertising through the, you know, by the way, another thing that has happened is every country has one stop shop. It is called SLEPA, Sierra Leone Investment Promotion Agency in Sierra Leone. It is called Tanzania Investment Center in Tanzania. It is called Zambia Development Agency in Zambia. They all have different names, but the mandate is the same. They were all <laughs> created by the World Bank Group, and their job is to make things easy for the foreign investor to come in so they don't have to deal with lots of bureaucracy and regulations. How do you make it friendly? Because the World Bank then does a ranking. It's called doing business rankings, according to which, by the way, Georgia ranks the highest for doing business. <laughs> so you know what their criteria for doing business ranking is. So countries are fighting with each other. It's almost like comparative advantage. Get rid of workers' rights, get rid of environmental regulations so you have a good ranking. So the reason I was telling you is that you have these agencies, one-stop shops that have been created, and you can go. So in Sierra Leone, SLEPA was advertising 85% of arable land is available. It's there. Nobody is using it, so make it productive. When we started doing research in Sierra Leone, we found only uh, this data was based on research that was done 40 years ago. And after we came out with our figures and our report, which is available on our website, even food and agriculture organization had to change its country page on Sierra Leone saying, actually, there's no more arable land available. Because Sierra Leone people practice what's called fallow lands. You know, they need that for their agriculture. You work on a piece of land, and then you have to move away and use another piece of land so this land can rejuvenate. Because they're not environmentally destroying all their lands. 
So because they have left it fallow, it is seen as available and people can move in. Or in case of Tanzania, what might seem as available is actually your corridors for pastoralists. Or in Ethiopia, it's the same, which some people are saying, you know, they need to change this way of life. You know, they need to settle down and settle down and do what? Well, perhaps they can be doing the menial job, some bush clearing that, you know, the kind of jobs that will come up. So the research is showing that there's a total myth of the land being available. In Mozambique, I went to the extension, meet the director of extension services. I mean, it looked like visiting his office that the civil war got over just yesterday. The building looks bombed out. The staircase, you have to really watch it, how you step and go up. And there's not even a fan. This is the director, not even an extension agent. This is in Maputo meeting the director, like the big haunt of extension services. And then I went to meet the director of Sepagri, which is the center for promoting investments. And it was like walking into Ritz Carlton by Mozambique standards. Walk in there. Um, you know, before you even enter, people are jumping at you with Coke and Sprite and whatever. And I walk into a room and behind me, this person locks the door and I'm going, holy, what's going to happen? And this office, I'm not kidding. It is surrounded by these um, filing cabinets. And on top of each one is a bottle of whiskey. This is a government office, a bottle of whiskey. And this uh, very jovial, very nice person, the director, came out. And he said, I'm so glad you're here. And yes, we want investment. Mozambique needs investment. Um, we have 7 million hectares to give away. And I was like, really wonderful. I mean, how, how do you know that? So it was a part of the same gentleman who said, you know, I'll drink up half the bottle. You just replace it and whatever you want. So I could copy a zip drive of how the government has identified 7 million hectares of land that is available. Not just that, they've also done work for you. What will be the best crop for you to grow? In what seasons? They have done feasibility studies for you. It's almost like buying a house where you already have a report and of course you bring in your own people to do diligence, but they've done it all. The only thing that is missing is I'm like, well, Dr. You know, Mr. Albino, what I'm confused about is what about the people? You're saying nobody is there and he says, because I had just gone down to this place where Emergent has invested. And even as you drive from Maputo to this area, Chakwe district, even the side of the freeway corn is growing. And here people are talking about available land and even the freeway is being cultivated. And every you know, five, 10 minutes you see this vibrant little market and people are selling their produce. So you are like, what are you talking about? Nobody lives here. And he says in Mozambique, you scratch the surface, these people will come out, but they're all squatters. Don't you know Mozambique state owns the land? So they're all squatters. So you find the piece of land and we'll work with you to clear up the land. So I, I think we need to kind of step back when we hear a lot about a lot of land is available. Just really quickly, you know, uh, a lot of people say, well, are you against investment? No, we're not against investment. We know one of the biggest problems is that there has been no investment in agriculture. That is one of the biggest problems, starting 70s, 80s, when the World Bank came down on third world countries saying, you do not have the luxury to spend your money on your agricultural programs, rural credit was dried up, your grain marketing boards were taken away, any kind of state parastatals were removed. Um, you know, it was a recipe for famine and hunger in these countries. Today, you look at Africa, more acreage is going into cocoa and cotton than growing into food that people eat, from cassava to sweet potatoes to... Uh, your, um, you know, any of the crops that people would eat, all of that is going away. And uh, so we are for investment, but to just assume that you'll put money, it'll mean increased production or livelihoods, that's a total myth. Because we have looked at the business plans and we have studied over 50 deals, specific deals. And uh, these reports, we do the whole large country report, but look at specific deals. In terms of economic development, the kind of tax holidays that are being given, the kind of benefits, incentives that are being offered to foreign investors. It's not even a problem of having a huge national pool and it does not trickle down. It will not even benefit the nation's economy. Because we did, for instance, a case in, of AgriSol Energy in Tanzania. They're planning to spend about $100 million over 10 years. But if you look at the prices of just maize in May of this year, if they just planted half of that land with that, they would be making, the net profits per year would be over 
395,000 dollars per a uh, million dollars per year so these are the kind of profits you're talking about and with tax holidays they have to give nothing back to tanzania and we calculated if you had the taxes that you ask your farmers and you ask your domestic people to provide what it would mean for tanzania the same thing we did for mozambique and you find these nations are net losers it's a win win for the investor but it's forget about what the impact on the community is even nationwide it's a net loss same thing for jobs um you know zambia has launched a scheme called the nansanga farm block that is like one of the big things for you know everyone is going crazy saying zambia development nansanga farm block so i met with very high up uh, people you know the land commissioner minister of agriculture so very high people in the ministry and i was asking them about the nansanga farm block and he asked them so why are you doing it it's for poverty alleviation and economic development you know things that we have heard you know okay so how do you plan to do that um are you asking investors for infrastructure oh no we took a world bank loan it's all been put in for you okay um are you going to be um asking for certain number of jobs oh no some general language in your proposal is good employment creation okay do i have to pay for the land oh no 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 it's a greenfield operation you'll get it for free but the tender that you put in to make a bid on this land that's $5000 so you could have you know for $5000 almost 100000 hectares of land or more okay very interesting are there going to be environmental regulations do i have to do you know uh, environmental social impact assessment oh no 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 you can do the brazilian thing and burn the place down we understand that you cannot do the green clearing of 20000 hectares of land these are all on tapes by the way that we have that's why we could go out and publicly say this if because we have had lots of lawsuit threats and they haven't gone anywhere um and then i was like so help me understand how will it lead to economic development and poverty alleviation and this person comes close to me and says you and i both know this is not about for you know investors this is not about doing the good and he gave me his card with gmail account and said and if you want your bid to win here's my gmail account right to me on this um so one could just go on so i'm not trying and and by the way when i give share this story i'm always a little hesitant because people tend to focus on corruption in africa but i hope what you're also picking is the corruption the international the international geopolitics of corruption which is breeding and supporting this corruption so it can thrive which is at the very top level which is at the very very top level in these countries we found in sierra leone a land deal done where the person who was representing uh the the lawyer who was representing the foreign investor is now the attorney general of sierra leone uh the land deal that i mentioned in south sudan the witness was a commissioner of human rights of south sudan so this is at the very top level and and these are people in power who can remain in power because tony blair initiative is supporting this you know tony blair the beloved labor man you know party candidate in england he's the one who's joining up with sierra leone agriculture to promote this investment in sierra leone george soros gates foundation and gates zone investments this is the vision for africa so you have large commercial farms and no where do you answer what happens to the food security of the people and livelihoods of people who lived on that land uh last thing i will end with this is they talk a lot about food security most of our research found that a a lot of people are just holding on to the land and sitting on it nothing has happened as susan pain of emergent asset management said you could be moronic and we could be moronic and not grow any food and we will make money well the way they will make money is by letting the value of land go up and you can turn around and sell it in many countries like ethiopia mozambique you cannot sell land because it belongs to the state remember so but what you can you can sell a company so i could go and set up a company as anurada my job will be to get all the dirty work done get the people off the ground and i do it for almost nothing and then you did company can walk in and i turn around and sell it to you for millions of dollars as we are seeing um you know a lot of uh, operations happen this way and then they turn around and sell it to other investors who pay them you know huge premiums for having cleared off the land other thing is the amount of agrofuels that are being grown on these lands uh, we are we never thought we would do it we are a research think tank but i think we had had enough with one deal which involves um 
in Tanzania, 800,000 acres, um, which is about 325,000 hectares of land. It's in the western part of Tanzania and the Rukwa region. Um, the brochures that we were given as investors was, um, it is a uh, great agricultural land. Iowa State University is a partner who has done all the research for us. Uh, it's very fertile, it's great. It's abandoned refugee camps. Till we go then we find and six, over 160,000 refugees lived there, have lived there for the last 40 years from Burundi. They came from Burundi, they made home there, they cleared the land. They made it fertile, productive. These people have only 4% of the land in the area, but they produce 40% of the produce of that area. Talk about being productive. These people have lived there. The children were born there. They consider Tanzania their home, but they have been told by the Tanzanian government, this is a sweetheart deal between the Tanzanian Prime Minister and Bruce Rastetter, who was investigated by New York Times last year for using a non-profit to run ads against the Democrat candidates in the last elections. Um, so you could have Republicans who favor subsidies for ethanol because he has the third largest ethanol plant in the country. He owns Summit Farms, which is one of the biggest agribusinesses. He is one of the most important Republicans in the Republican Party where all, you know, he's like the kingmaker gets to decide who the presidential candidate will be with the largest fundraiser happens in Iowa at his place. So the deal is they are telling investors, this land is abandoned land while people live and they're not willing to move and they are being pushed out of that land. So we have launched actually an action alert. And the good news is we have niched nearly 5,000 letters around the world, especially from Africa has been sent to Bruce Rastetter and to Tanzanian prime minister saying, abandon this project, the world is watching. You cannot do this. So if you get a chance, please visit our website on homepage. You can send your letter. The most beautiful thing that happened this morning, I woke up and found a letter from Sierra Club USA and Sierra Club, I mean, yeah, who would have ever thought of it? And Canada, they sent a letter on behalf of the million members to AgriSoul and Tanzanian Prime Minister saying stay off that land. So it's a beautiful, yeah, it was, it was really amazing coalition coming together. So I would really urge you to send out that, that letter and um, spread the word. Um, what you can do, I know this is University of Cornell and academia. What can we do? We, Africa seems very far away, though not very far away for a lot of us here. Uh, what can be done? You know, I always say the more you learn about it, you discover it's actually very close. The investors... There are our universities, for instance, at the, in New York this May when there was an ag investment conference. Cornell University and Dormant people were there wanting to know how they can get some good money out of it, like Harvard University has been invested. Rumors are they pulled out their $500 million from Emergent after we came out and told the world that they invested in Emergent. Vanderbilt newspaper today had a great article where students are up in arms demanding the university pulls out from funds which are investing in land in Africa and taking over lands in Africa. There are things, like I said, there are U.S. Uh, theocraft, there is U.S. investor that is involved, so I would urge you to know about it, question it, ask about it, demand transparency, and, and at least, you know, you can invest, there's nothing wrong with it, but at least have the information on the table. And something very simple, ensure a principle that everyone has agreed internationally. Free prior informed consent. If I'm about to move into your home, it would be only decent for me to say, do you give me free prior informed consent before I move in? If I'm going to take over your lawn where you are growing your beautiful daffodils or tulips to say, you know what, I'm taking over, it would only be fair. Africa is not for taking. Thank you. Are you still um, working in the seven countries that you mentioned at the beginning and sort of what the second stage mm -hmm. of, of stage two of research is. And then um, also um, you mentioned um, the government telling people in South Sudan about um, you know what their rights were. Or I, mm -hmm. I, and it sort of it made me wonder in general what kind of resistance are you seeing to land grabbing anywhere and um, mm -hmm. how effective is that? In terms of, of what we are doing is a couple of things. One is we're continuing this research, which again, like I said, somebody else such as World Bank or somebody else should have answered the questions that we're trying to um, answer. 
And um, so as long as we have resources, we'll keep doing that. In the second phase, we are releasing the reports that I mentioned along with a lot of other briefs, which also look at land grabs or really water grabs as well. So a very detailed, thorough studies of what it means, for instance, when you have Nile and you have all these agricultural investments in Ethiopia, South Sudan, Sudan mm -hmm. happening around that, what it means and what it means for conflict and peace in that region. So that's the second phase in terms of continued research we are moving into. Bad stuff, really bad stuff is happening in French-speaking countries, which get ignored because, you know, oh, it's French-speaking. So we are now going to Cameroon, Gabon, um, and, other, and DRC. Um, and it's, you know, it's, um, it's an interesting uh, time for us. So we're doing that. Second is we have been working with international land coalitions. Some of you might have heard of them. This is a body out of Rome where World Bank to Everyone is a member who are about to release these metrics. Um, um, we are working with them and with Global Witness, uh, who have done amazing work around extractive industries and using that experience in extractives to start putting together, we undertook a massive exercise of talking to groups around the world and impacted communities what needs to be transparent. We are not trying to come up with a next set of principles that if you have this, it's okay. The communities, if they say no, free, prior, informed consent adopted by IFC, International Finance Corporation, Equator Principles, any of the financial institutions who do lending, uh, even if, but we do want to know what people are feel should be transparent. So we have been engaged in this exercise. We have put out the first report that we are circulating with the stakeholders. And then in January, we are having a meeting with interested parties. How do we build that? not to make these land deals fine and okay, but really at least a monkey wrench. You know, what is our criteria that we at least need to have? Uh, the third thing which we are doing, which we have been asked to do, we are very aware of the fact that we are a think tank based in the United States. We don't believe in going and interfering in countries. We have a job to do with the World Bank and our own governments and our aid agencies. Um, when I was in South Sudan, actually, the, uh, the Parliament Committee on Natural Resources, they basically asked us to start organizing seminars and workshops and trainings. So we are working on putting together trainings where we are not trying to tell people of South Sudan what they should do. But an interesting example, they had brought in some Norwegians to do a template on a forestry concession. And we could say, hey, what we learned in Sierra Leone, <coughs> for instance, a company out of North Carolina um, called Ecotech Timber, which has this huge agroforestry concession in Sierra Leone, proudly tells people, investors, that, hey, we're working with Virginia Tech and doing germplasm prospecting. That when you give a forestry concession, it is to cut the trees and harvest it. It is not for germplasm prospecting. And this person was, what does that mean? So we are doing sharing experiences, the research we have done that we can share. Um, most of the contracts we have looked at, for instance, they call for arbitration in England or in Portugal or in the United States. And you're mm -hmm. like, can you imagine a poor country? I mean, South Sudan, only 40 kilometers of road is paved in that country. Now, if that government has to find a multinational corporation, go figure what that means. So, so we are working with them in sharing experiences. We will not draft any templates for any contracts. That's not what we do. A lot of this is being facilitated through trade agreement and bilateral investment treaties. So we are bringing in South Center, which is an intergovernmental body in Geneva, which provides um, trainings for, um, for, uh, for um, negotiators from third world countries. Usually, you know, one person will represent the whole of like West Africa and trade negotiations while the US Army will move in. I mean, not kidding, on no dose, and these trade negotiations go on for 10 days. And they have this amazing thing that turns, and while there's this you know, poor person representing the whole of West Africa do, you know, falling asleep after seven hours of trade negotiations. So you have South Center that tries to back them. We're bringing them in to kind of, like South Sudan, what kind of bilateral investment treaties you get into, what you do. So when governments have asked us, we are doing that. We are doing these trainings for all the governors of South Sudan, all the ministries of agriculture, forestry, environment. So. Resistance to land grabs, we don't hear about it, but I told you about this, I've told you about agri soil. I mean, you know, so people are fighting back. We talked about companies that are doing the wrong thing. Did you run into any companies that are doing the right things? And if not, what are 
mm -hmm. might you see as a good investment? So what we have tried to do is, and we'll be putting that out too, we have put together, th if your goal is to increase production, if your goal is to improve food security, if your goal is to create employment, we have put together 35 cases, and these are not just, oh, they use sustainable practices. We have gone into the methodology. We have gone into what was done. We have used the FAO standards of how the produce was measured, that it has increased. We have put them together. We'll be releasing that report too very soon. What it does show is that when you keep do talking about this top-down model of investment till it really is focused on agricultural policies of a country where you're focused on development of smallholder agriculture, it will not work. Because people want a quick fix. If I can't invest in it, where I can invest? You know, Calvert, who can... Uh, sorry, I don't want to pick on Calvert, but... Um, mm -hmm. I mean, your definition of sustainability cannot be, oh, thank God McDonald's now use recyclable paper for their tray, so therefore they can be fit for Calvert. So, you know, so uh, our, our, our examples are very different. So if you really want to invest, it clearly shows where you need to invest if you want to really boost production and stuff. And, and it's not really rocket science. You know, I mentioned ISTAD report, International Assessment of Scientific... Oh. Science, technology, knowledge development, which was the blueprint for next 50 years. What do we need to do if we want to feed the world in a sustainable way? Or you look at um, UNEP's uh, report on how to feed Africa, and it says that if given 90% of the population, farmers have one to five acres of land, you know you need to do sustainable organic agriculture. You can't put them on the treadmill of chemical fertilizers and GMOs. That's totally upside down and backwards. Mm -hmm. And this is not some, you know, progressive think tank. This is your United Nations agencies and scientists saying that. So. Many of the examples you show here about government leaseholds, where um, there's a different situation in Liberia where there's freehold. So people own their land. And I just came back and I saw that in Cape Mount there are hundreds and hundreds of acres of land that someone has leased to a foreign company that now they're growing um, oil pump. Mm -hmm. So what kind of remedies do we have if it's, if it's freehold? Yeah, that's it. You know, it came up yesterday too, and I'm glad you brought up Liberia because Liberia is an interesting case. There's a whole website and it's very transparent. You can just find out it's one of the unique countries which is actually a slap in our face to some extent because you can go to the website and you can see which foreign investors have come in, what leases are there. And it goes into that question of agricultural policy. Till you have agricultural policies that are supporting the small farmers, till the small farmers are considered bankable by the banks, uh, this will exactly happen where they will move out. So a lot of people feel the solution is let's give titles to the small farmers in Africa. No. I mean, you South Sudan, which has identified three kinds of land, community land, state land, and private land. How do you protect the community land? Zambia, 94% of the land is traditional lands, communal lands. How do you protect that? In Zambia, it's interesting. As long as it's communal land, it's not bankable. I go in, I get 20,000 hectares, and immediately Barclays, everyone moves in to give me loans. So till we have the policy space for governments to create that agricultural support system like we used to have, they were not perfect, but we threw the baby out with the bathwater. The parastatals, I mean, why would farmers produce more if there's no market? You have to give them a fixed price till you have the minimum price, till you have all of those. And at Ben & Jerry's, we have seen with dairy farmers we work, you give them a fixed price, you give them a premium for producing milk a certain way, caring dairy and stuff. It works really well, and it works for us too, but till you have that, the freehold land will go to titles are not the solution. Not necessarily. So, have you come across any African country whom you think have uh, a good land policy? A lot of countries have very good land policy. I mean, actually, if you look at it on paper, Mozambique has a very good land policy. South Sudan, where, like I said, people fought that war so the land could belong to community. They are really struggling with it, except they have no policy space. They barely became independent, and everyone is rushing in to take over the lands from India to Chinese to the U.S. Um, so you find this kind of schizophrenia. That's the best way of describing it. Tanzania, too, is actually one of the countries which has a biofuel policy. So, you know, you have a lot of these countries, and it keeps coming back to how do we assure policy space to these countries that they can move forward 
do consultations with the governments and the people to decide what is the best way forward for them. And that space is being taken away. And so on one hand, there's this, you'll see in the Mozambique report that we will release, it's fascinating. So Mozambique has this great land law. They have figured out how it has to be administered, even though the land, you know, all of that. And then the USAID person moving in and saying, you got to use, um, I can never pronounce it right, the, a guillotine. Use a guillotine approach. Just get rid of all this. Make it, and, and then it's like, otherwise you're not going to be in the world community. You're not going to get the loans. You're not going to get that. So a lot of countries do have very good laws. Have you seen any, any states that are actually finally having a backlash towards some of these deals? I mean, it has nothing to do with bank agriculture, but I noted that in Kenya, some of these 99-year leases that were in, when you get a 99-year lease, could you ever envision the end of it uh, that were given in colonial times? Mm -hmm. They're finally saying, okay, uh, that was a, and they've been passed on from you know, uh, colonial, post-colonial sure. family to family, that they're finally thinking of uh, taking those back. Oh, sure. You know, there's example of Madagascar. Um, you, you're familiar with that. How many of you know about it? Oh, um, sorry, it's been quoted so often. Uh, in Madagascar, half of the country's arable land was being given away to Daewoo, the South Korean company. And that resulted in the opposition party taking it on and the government collapsed. In case of South Sudan, I mean, why did the president suddenly say, okay, if the people are against this million hectares going away that nobody knew about, including people in the government, including the president, it stays canceled. But there's other kind of things that are happening while I was in South Sudan. There's a Chinese company that has come in and took over, got a forestry concession. It's in the area where the Dinka tribes are. They hired the local Dinka people to work. And when it came time for payment, they wouldn't pay. So the people went and asked for their wages. They were beaten. I cannot verify it, but I was told that one of the Dinka men was killed. So they took away the two Chinese managers and gave them the Dinka treatment. You know, you pull out the front teeth and the facial scarring. <laughs> Part of me says, go Dinka. <laughs> um, sorry, I mean, no, sorry, that is not to be confused with the OI position. I mean, you spend too much time on the land uh, and you see what's happening. You are like, what will it take? Here is a country that has come out of conflict because of the land and resources, and then you put it again. You meet generations. You know, you meet 20-year-old men, and you know that they have fought a war. They have seen their mother or a sibling or a father being killed in front of them. You know that they have been boy soldiers. You meet girls and you know they have been raped. And, and, and to see all that that nation has gone through and to subject it again, uh, it makes you say, Godinka. But these stories are over and over again. In uh, Zambia, you know, they just had elections. And the, government, the president has finally lost the elections. Here the reaction was to the Chinese investors in Zambia. So it is beginning to, you know, people are sick and tired of it. Uh, the economist minister recently fond of saying that the economic downturn has not affected Africa. Do you have evidence of an accelerated <laughs> rate of hedge fund involvement in Africa's post-economic uh, downturn? One and two, uh, examples of more people jumping into hedge funds for the greater returns, trying to accelerate a recovery. Mm -hmm. from the downturn. So I'm looking for a direct link between the downturn and land grab activity. Um, economists would tend to look at GDP and say, look, it's, it's not Totally. You, totally. There's a link. If you look at it with the economic downturn and places to invest in and where the investment is going. A um, few other things have happened. Um, Argentina recently is, uh, started this debate and uh, the president is saying that not more than 20% of the country's land should be foreign owned. So these are important because these are places where people went and invested before. And so they're saying they had export ban before, they are doing this, so they're moving out of that region. Eastern Europe had the same kind of things. So they're rushing into Africa, and if you start seeing investment, you would think, wow, everyone suddenly loves Africa, investment's going up. But that's going up because of the hedge fund activity. And it is high, high investment risk, but these places are also promising 25 to 40% return, which you would not hear anywhere else. So high investment comes with high risk. I guess my question really is, is can, in the data you have on your website, can I, can I find the data I need to make that linkage between the economic downturn and this activity from the data on your website? Let's talk. We can't put everything on a website, also for legal reasons. We have put a lot of stuff, and like I said, we have a lot of lawsuit threats. 
And we can't show all the cards. We also have to hold some close to keep those cards away from us. They know, they touch us, we can... Yes, ma'am. So. <laughs> but we're very happy to spread the information, you know. <laughs> uh, in terms of China, obviously China gets a lot of attention. So is there a great awareness of what China is doing in Africa? You know, it's interesting, yeah. I mean, actually, everywhere that I did field work, I haven't done field work, and we have, I mean, and, and really we had, by the way, researchers on the ground. I would go in to support them and meet at the ministry level or um, investment funds. But in the places I've been to, it was amazing how everyone would badmouth China because also people in Africa know that people coming in from the West want to hear that. <laughs> it, you, it's very, it's fascinating. They know, the investment agencies know that somebody coming in from U.S. want to hear China bashing and they give a good dose of it to you. And the minute, you know, you show some Indian sign, which I would do, then they kind of change a little bit, like, okay, we don't have to do the whole you please U.S. thing. But you go to Maputo, the thing is, and I'm not condoning the Chinese, please, don't get me wrong. They're in it for the long run. First of all, agriculture. It's not the Chinese. That's a total myth. It is not Chinese investing in agriculture in Africa. Uh-uh. They are interested in forestry. They are interested in mining. It is true they're bringing in sometimes their own workers from China, which is causing a lot of conflict. These are also the people who are building infrastructure. It is like the English came to India and they gave us the railways, which were never really used by us. Famine mm -hmm. still happened. Railways weren't used to move the food around. So they don't benefit the local people. But these are the people who are putting in the infrastructure, unlike the Western hedge funds and the rest. That's all I would say. But what you need is very strict regulation. Okay, well, it's almost four, so anyone who'd like to can stay around for a while and ask, talk.